So I was watching a TED Talk video this last week. <clears throat> And the woman was really, really great. And she was talking about conversations and how to have difficult conversations, which I thought, well, that's an appropriate one to be watching right now. And she said some interesting things. She said, how many of you have ever unfriended someone on Facebook because you don't like their political views? And of course, the room kind of nervously laughed. And then she said, how many of you have been in Walmart and avoided someone on purpose because you just didn't want to see or talk to them? And then the whole room laughed. Nobody was nervously laughing at that one. They're like, yeah, we've all done that. And she said, even trivial issues today are generating tremendous passion and disagreement. Isn't that true? I mean, trivial things, things don't even matter we're fighting about. And then she said, there was a Pew Research study that was done, 10,000 Americans, and here's what we've uncovered about what's going on. This won't surprise you. She said, at this moment in our history, we are more polarized and divided than any time in our history. Isn't that a little bit sad? None of us, I think, doubts it, but it's sad. This is the most divided we've ever been as a country. And she said, name an issue, corona. Are we divided on that? Oh yeah, oh my goodness, yes. How about racism? How about white privilege? How about vaccinations? We could go on and on and on, right? With all the things that right now have really separated and divided us as a nation. And it's gotten to the point now where we can't even discuss these things. People can't have a discussion about any of those topics or so many other things because it breaks down into unhealthy conflict and division. So consequently, we're not fixing anything. We don't understand each other. We don't have any kind of unity as a nation. It's a real problem. Now, here's what I believe. Jesus, if you know anything about what Jesus said, one of the, one of the things he repeatedly said was he w- his hope is that we would be peacemakers in this world. Matter of fact, he actually said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers. God's blessing rests upon those who want to bring peace into this world. And I think that a divided time like this is a perfect opportunity for the church to be what he wanted it to be, which is a peacemaking organization. I believe that. The problem is you don't generally tend to think of churches as peaceful places. Unfortunately, this isn't where people go when they want to see peace. Instead, the polarization that's existing in our community has existed in the church for a long time. These are actually things that churches have fought and split over. I just put some new things up. I don't think I've ever put some of these up before. The appropriate length of a pastor's beard. Did you know that? Churches fight about that. That's worth it, right? Good, Good use of time. Color carpeting, yeah, that's old. We've done that. Churches have thought about that before. What type of bread should be served at communion? What to do with the fake dusty plants in every single church that exist? There are churches that fight about that. And how long the guy should go on. It's like, well, yeah, okay, but people fight about that. It was so funny because now when I first started out, oh, 1991, when I was first preaching, I was short-winded. I, my sermons oftentimes would end after 15 minutes. I had nothing left to say. So I know it's hard to believe. So you listen to my messages now. It's like, what? Yep, that's how I used to do it. It's like, well, I got nothing else. I'm done now. And people were mad about that. <laughs> I'm probably the only pastor in the history of the world that were mad when I went too short. But they were mad. So I mean, people fight and have conflict about all of this stuff and so much more. I mean, I could fill that screen. Years ago, there was a staff member who was really creative and, and artsy. And so I asked her to decorate the lobby of the church at the time with, for, because it was closing in on Christmas. And so I said, could you make it look nice? And so she did. It was beautiful and tastefully done. And on the fireplace mantle, she put about a 12 inch tall Santa as part of her decorations. And it was really cute and really pretty. And I didn't think anything of it till the next Sunday. When in walked a church member who walked in, took one look at that Santa on the mantle and came and found me. She was so mad. She's like, we don't come here to worship Santa. And I said, you know, I've never seen anyone worship Santa. That'd be kind of interesting. I've never seen anyone get over, almighty Santa, we bow before you, we'll sing. We're not, nobody's worshiping him. She said, yeah, but it has nothing to do with the season. Well, neither does a Christmas tree, and neither do twinkle lights, and neither do the decorations we put up. None of this has anything to do with the season. It's just pretty. That's all it is, but she would not have any of it. She was going to fight a war to have the 12-inch Santa removed. I don't remember what choice I made at the time. I don't remember if I'm like, 
we're just not going to have that fight and left it up or took it down, I don't remember, but it didn't matter. In a short time later, she wanted to fight about 10 other things, and a few months later, she was gone. It's like, what is this? We really have to draw a line in the sand on absolutely everything like this? Blessed are the peacemakers, and you want to cause conflict about everything. It just doesn't seem to fit with the Christianity that Jesus asked us to bring into this world. And it's, I'm, sure that you're, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying with that. Jesus' life was attractive. The church's life in America too often is repulsive. And people leave the church in droves every year. But Jesus' life was very attractive. And people wanted to be with him. So something is broken. And so we're in this series called Where Do We Go From Here? And what I'm doing in this series is I'm just trying to talk about some of the cultural things that exist right now in our society and show you what the Bible would say about some of these things. So we're going to continue this series by talking about how do we keep our differences from tearing us apart? Because that's what's happening in the world and in the church. So I want to ask you to open up your program, and inside I want to ask you to take your notes out, grab your notes and a pen. Welcome to those of you who are watching on YouTube, and your, the notes are right in the description section, and to those of you who are watching on our website at penulechurch.life. Right there below the video link are these notes. I want to encourage you to, to pop them open and follow along as we go through this today. So we begin with this. The very first thing, if we're going to keep our differences from tearing us apart, and we all have differences, is we have to raise the value of Christian unity. It has to be important to us that there's unity in a church, that we really hang in there with each other. Christian unity has to be important, or else it's just not going to happen. And I wish I, could, I wish I couldn't spend the rest of my time just telling you stories about this, like this one I'm going to tell you, but this is just the reality of the world we live in. There was a church, it was, in a, it was thriving. It was starting to have a real community-wide impact on their, uh, where they lived. And then all of a sudden, this, this issue popped up in the church, and it was small and insignificant at first, but then all of a sudden, people started taking sides, and it got so big that they literally split the church over it. Half the group was so mad, they went down the street, started a new church, and both churches still exist today, neither of them having any real impact in the community. So all the good that was being done shattered and destroyed, and you got two little inward-focused churches now just barely trying to hold on. You know what the issue was over? After church, that church liked to have coffee and refreshments. And part of the group wanted to have the coffee back by the back door so when people left, they could just have it. And some of them wanted it in the fellowship hall. And they split a church over that. And I wish I could tell you that was isolated and that kind of stuff doesn't happen, but you know better. That kind of stuff happens all the time in American Christianity. Unity is meaningless to us. My way and what I want is the most important thing. And so I will fight and trash a church in order to have what I want. Who cares where the coffee's served? Give it to them. Have a waitress going around during the service. Who cares? I don't care. But people care about these things. Let me show you what Jesus cares about. Look at this. Jesus said this. Here's a, he was praying to his father and let his disciples hear his words. He said, Father, I pray that they, the disciples, my church, will be one, just as you and I are one. And he said, I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one, as we are one. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Now, look at that phrase, perfect unity. How close are we? As a church in America, to perfect unity, his prayer. You know what I was struck by this morning as I was reading this verse again in my preparation? Jesus knows what it's like to have unanswered prayers. Because this was his prayer. And the church in America is nowhere near perfect unity, right? And, but three times one prayer says, I pray they'd be one, I pray they'd be one, I pray that they'd have perfect unity. Just, this really matters. If Jesus repeats himself, it's always significant. It's the only thing I know of in the entire Bible where he pe repeats himself. No, there's one other th time that I know he did this. Uh, only one other time that I can think of where he repeated himself three times because the, the topic was so important. I pray they be one. And he said, by the way, the, the oneness, he said, is a picture to the world of what the Trinity is like. He said, I pray they be one just like we are one. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one together. And he said, people should look at the church and the oneness they have and they'll get a picture of what God is like. 
Eek! Hope not. But he said that's what it's supposed to be. Look at, the, look at the church and see the unity of the Father and the Son and the Spirit together. That's what he says. And part of why he wants this oneness is because what we can do when we're one. I believe the church is God's uh, vehicle to address poverty issues in the world and to be peacemakers and be part of changing lives and help others find freedom from addictions and rescue those in need. All of these things are part of what he wants his church to do. That's why in the New Testament he calls his church his body because it's his hands and feet and activity in this world to do things like this. And the church's history is filled with times when they were one and they accomplished amazing things. Last summer I did a series on how Jesus Jesus changed the world. And I talked to you about specific things that his followers, his church brought into the world that did not exist before Christianity. Things like public education in America. When the pilgrims landed, they brought this and mandated it in their colonies it was required that you paid, you paid taxes to, to, to hire teachers to educate children in their colonies because of their Christian faith. The very first universities in, in America that still exist today were Christians, started by Christians who wanted to make education a priority. Hospitals started because of Christians. Orphanages started because of Christians. Churches together got together and said, we need to do what Jesus said, care for the widows and orphans, so we're going to start places where orphans can go. And too many relief agencies even to begin to name them all. Over and over and over again, the history of the church is beautiful and powerful when they are together, because together, uh, we, we solve problems better. Together, we make better decisions and make up for each other's weaknesses and develop our strengths together and support and encourage each other. There's so much together that can never happen alone. And when we're fractured and splintered, all of these things are diminished. It only happens in our unity that the church becomes this beautiful organization of tremendous power because we're not just doing it as people, we're doing it with people with the backing of God. So that's why it's so tremendously powerful when we get this right. And Jesus doesn't hide what the glue is that's supposed to hold us together. So he says, unity, unity, unity. And you want to know what creates that unity? It's, it's this one thing. By this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. It is that one word, love. It's love that does the, the, that's the glue that holds us together. So on your notes, here's the key. If we really want to value unity the way that Jesus tells us to, then we have to commit to loving each other no matter what. No matter what. Because love is what holds us together. Love is what keeps us together when we have differences. You know, years and years and years ago, I was in the middle of a church conflict, and I made a list, and I started it this way. What I've always wanted, I found this list when I was prepping this message, I thought, oh yeah, this is what I've always wanted. You know, as a pastor for so long, what I always wanted, because sometimes, you know, I've been on the receiving end of a tremendous amount of cruelty and criticism over the years. I've been a part of two different church splits, awful, awful stuff. And in the middle of those things, you don't get what you want. But what I always wanted in those times, I want friends that have their eyes wide open when they look at me. They're like, yep, Brian is flawed. He's got flaws, and I love him anyway. Isn't that what you want? You want people that know the real you, and they just love you anyway. And I want people that see my potential. And you want that too. You don't want people that only see the things that you do wrong. You want people that believe in your potential. And they see how great you could be, and that's what their focus is on. Not the screw-ups in your life. And I wanted people that hang in there with me no matter what. They're like, yep, made another mistake. That's Brian, but I'm not going anywhere. Isn't that what you want too? You don't want people that just leave when you screw up? Because you're going to screw up. And I want people who believe the best about me, not the worst. Isn't that what you want? Don't you hate it when you find out people are saying negative things about you and other people are believing them? I mean, isn't it just incredibly painful when that happens? And this is what I think love looks like. And this is, now the interesting thing is, this is what I want, so you know what that means. It's what I have to offer people. So is this the list that you offer to people around you? I, I love you, so I see your flaws, still love you. I see your mistakes, not going anywhere. I'm still committed to you. 
because it's love that produces the unity that Jesus values. So the question is, is it important to you? Is it important to you? So that's where we start. But that's not, the big, that's not the finish line. The second thing that has to happen, once we understand how important unity is and we really start to pursue it, now we have to learn to distinguish between what is essential and what is not essential. And this is where Christians, again, totally screw this up. Because we don't have a clue what's essential and what isn't essential. So we let ourselves fight about the wrong things. Then here's the ultimate problem. Too many Christians believe that every opinion they have is essential. And every, every way that they look at every minor doctrine is essential. And they have no clue that the Bible actually says this. I want you to understand, I want you to write it down now and I'll explain it for those of you who may not be aware of this. The Bible clearly teaches that our God in heaven allows for differences of opinion or beliefs on non-essentials. It is so clear in the Bible, I can't believe Christians don't get this. But again, if we don't know what the Bible says, then you're not going to be aware of just how specific God is when it comes to this subject. So let me show you what that means. First off, when it comes to essentials, there are things that are absolutely essential to Christianity. And on the essentials, what we try and do is we try and have real unity around the essentials. For us, the essentials are those core doctrines that if you compromise them, Christianity's gone. If you go to our website, we've listed our essential doctrines right there on our doctrinal page. You can read it anytime you want to. Let me give you one example, though. We don't believe that Jesus was just a really nice guy. We believe that he was God who left his throne, that God the Son, who left his throne in heaven and entered into the world, to die on a cross to pay for all the unloving things in our lives. That's what we believe. So, plenty of people don't believe that, right? They think that Jesus was just a good guy, a good teacher, a good moral teacher. Okay, for us, that's essential. We'll never compromise that. And if somebody came in and started, wanted to lead a coalition to say, Jesus is just a really nice guy, they don't win that battle. That is a fight we fight. We protect that because if you change it, well, you know how many thousands of good men were crucified by the Romans on the crosses during that time? We don't even know their names and they have no impact in our lives today because they were just people. But if God willingly died for us, something must be bigger to understand about that, right? There's something big going on there. That's why it's essential compromise it, and Christianity is no longer Christianity. But the list is very, very short of what's essential. Now, second are the non-essentials. And in non-essentials, we show grace and treat each other with respect. Everything else that's not on that very short little list is not essential. And so on those, we just show grace, we extend grace, we treat each other respectfully. Here's a short list of all the things. I mean, I could, couldn't I just fill a slide after slide after slide after slide after slide with non-essentials? All of these things are not essential All of them. And we could go on and on and on and on and on and on. And churches split over these every day in America, every single day. I mean, it's ridiculous how much we fight over these things. And they're non-essential because nobody's eternity is, is in the balance based on what they believe about these things. Nobody. Can you imagine, I have been trick-or-treating since I was young enough to trick-or-treat. Didn't even know it was controversial until years and years later. I trick-or-treated when I was in college. Because if somebody wants to hand me free chocolate one day of the year, I'm taking it. I don't care how old I am. You're offering me chocolate, my answer is yes. And yet there are so many Christians who turn the lights off and they don't come out and they, they call it Satan's Day. And I've had so many conversations over the years over this. With it, I got in fights. Uh, no, I had conflict because, you know, in, in previous ministries, we'd allow Halloween parties and things like that. And people are so mad about it. It's like, I, I, I have a Bible. There is nothing in here about Satan owning a day of the year. None. He owns none of them. God owns them all. I don't care what other people do on that day. I'm going to do something that's really good. So to make it essential, here's what would have to happen. I die, and I'm standing at the pearly gates, and God's like, Brian, good to see you. Walk it. Oh. Hmm. So I see here it says that uh, October 31st, every year, you went out and took candy from your neighbors. Hmm. You know, other than that, the record looks good, but I'm sorry, you go to hell forever because of that. I'm sorry. I hope the candy was good. It's like, not essential. 
And it plays no part in determining my eternity. None. And so because it's not essential, we don't fight about it. We can have discussions about it, respectful discussions. If they are not respectful, you can't have them. Now, all of this is contained in one chapter in the Bible. Romans 14, one of the best chapters. I remember the first time I read this, and read Romans 14, I'm like, how come Christians are doing this? It is black and white in the Bible. Let me show you. For those of you who may not be familiar with this. In Romans 14, it says, I want you to accept other believers who are weak in the faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. What if we did that one sentence alone? Don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong, right? Universally ignored verse in the Bible. Because people like to argue about everything. But he goes on and he gives an example. He said, for instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Now, there was a cultural piece to this, but you could take that example out and put anything. One person believes it's okay to go knock on your neighbor's doors on October 31st and take chocolate from them for free, and another person doesn't believe that. One person believes it's okay to have a beer. Another person doesn't believe that. One person believes that it's okay to use all the musical instruments in a worship service, and another person doesn't believe that. How, I mean, I could go on and on, right? Thousands of real life examples. So, this is the reality. So, what should we do when we have these differences? Look at how black and white he is. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't, and those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them, and He's accepted them all. Both groups acceptable. Which, out of these verses are so many clear applications. Let me just give you two on your notes. Letter C the first thing that God would say so clearly is is you don't argue about non-essentials. He's so clear about this. You don't argue about non-essentials. Look at what he says at the end of the chapter. In case you missed all of that earlier, Romans 14, 22, he said, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. In other words, let me interpret this as clearly as I can. If you want to know God's crass way of saying it, he would say, whatever you believe about these things, shut up. Shut up. That's literally what he's saying. He says, you don't talk about it with others. You don't get into arguments with others. You keep between yourself and God. Because if the outcome of your conversations is division, you are not on the path God wants for you. I was like, wait a second. I'm gonna have a lot of conversations with God. Yes, go ahead, all you want. But if the outcome of all the things you're saying is people are picking sides, you're not on the God's path. In Christianity, we'd be so well served by Christians obeying that verse. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Stop talking. Stop. Because it's resulting in divisions and his church is being divided and it's not taking, well, you know what really has to happen? And this can be really understandable for some of you. Some of you have to stop thinking it's your job to fix everyone's opinion that's different than yours. You re some of you know that you're a little bit controlling and you like to, you kind of react to this. You're, you're going to have the hardest time with this. You've got to stop thinking it's your job to fix differences of opinions. It's not. It's your job to love them. That's your job. So that's the first thing. The, the last, the next application, which I just absolutely, oh, wait. Um, that's how he wrote it. Here's how we reinterpret it today. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. We reinterpret it. So whatever you believe about these things, post repeatedly on social media, right? Isn't that what we do? And make sure that when you post it, it kind of has a little bit of a kick for the other side, right? How many times do we see that? It's like, well, this is, it. This is what I believe, and anyone who doesn't believe that, you're kind of stupid for not believing this, right? How many times do we write them insultingly? So it's automatically going to create division. Or you know what else I've seen in churches, having been through church, two church splits? Whatever you believe about these things, build your coalition in the church to get your way. I've seen that over and over again in, in the history of the church. That's what we do. And what does he actually say? Again, just to drive it home, keep between yourself and God. It's not essential. We're not going to fight about it. We're going to keep it between ourselves and God. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, the second application is this. Letter D, don't you ever let yourself look down on people that have a difference of opinion from you, especially on one of these non-essentials. You never let yourself look down on them. 
And I love what he says. Look at how clear it is. Again, you, okay, just in case, I'm, I'm not making this up. Look what he says. You must not look down on those people. You must not look down on those Republicans. You must not look down on those Democrats. You must not look down on those who believe in the signed gifts. You must not look down on those who do not. You must not look down on those who want to put a 12-inch Santa in the lobby. And you must not look down on those who don't. And that verse hits me. Because sometimes when I tell that Santa story, I roll my eyes. Sometimes when I tell the stories about Christians wanting to fight over trick-or-treat or a Halloween party, I roll my eyes. And you know what the eye roll is communicating? Disrespect. And I'm looking down on them. I'm part of the problem. It's not okay. And you want to see how ridiculous it is. You look at why we don't look down on them. The verse specifically says, God has accepted Democrats. God has accepted Republicans. God has accepted the Santa people and the no Santa people. God has accepted the trick-or-treaters and the no trick-or-treaters. God has accepted them. So can you, can you hear the arrogance of this? God has accepted them, but I reject them. Well, who in the world do you think you are? Whoa. It doesn't have any place in Christianity. None. None at all. It's so significant. They're acceptable to God, therefore they're acceptable to me, even if we disagree about an opinion or an issue or belief. But can you imagine the unity that would create? We understood what was essential. That we're worth having a real serious conversations about. Everything else non-essential. And in most of those cases, cases, I'm not even going to tell you. I'm going to tell God what I believe, not even going to talk to you about it. Because I'm not going to let it be a divisive thing for us. And I'm going to keep that love in place. And we're going to hold on to each other out of love. And I'm never going to look down on you because of your views or beliefs, even when they're different from mine. I'm never going to let... Can you imagine that? That's the church. That's what the church is supposed to be like. And then we could actually do the most important part of this. Care more about the things that God cares about. This would be incredible, right? If we could actually get down to the work of what God really cares about. I, I, it's not even hard to find stories. So. It makes me sad to say that because it's so easy to find stories like this. There's a very traditional church and they every week sang their songs to an organ and a group of people wanted to add a keyboard, uh, I mean a piano, to the front. And it was voted down. In unhealthy churches you vote about a lot of things. So there was a vote, voted down. So you had this two group, the piano group and the non-piano group. And so they started fighting the church, and eventually the piano group pooled their money together and bought a really nice piano and just put it up front. You can imagine how well that went over, right? Love just covers a multitude of sins, right? Mm, yeah. Huge conflict. A couple of weeks later, everyone comes in on Sunday morning. The piano's gone. In Christian love, they lied. Whoever did it never admitted it. They had no idea what had happened until a few weeks later. That church had a big baptistry tank in the back where, you know, when somebody wanted to be baptized, they'd fill it with water and they'd baptize them in the church. And the janitor thought, it's been a while since I cleaned it, popped the lid off that thing, and there was the piano <laughs> in the baptistry tank. They'd hidden it. I, I wish I could tell you I was making this stuff up, but it isn't. And here's what I really think. Just think, if half the energy that went into fighting about pianos went into actually doing what God wanted, oh my goodness, we would tremendously change the world. The world would be completely different today because of the power of the church with God's backing. It would be unbelievable what God would do if we just cared more about the things that God cared about. Put that energy into those things. So what does he care about? First thing he cares about is the condition of my heart. And I want you to write that word, my, huge, just like I did there. Because this is where my focus needs to be. My focus needs to be on the condition of my heart.
because I have an alternative, don't I? I could put my focus on the condition of your heart and the behavior in your life and the choices you're making, right? And isn't that true? That happens in a lot of churches. You walk in and you feel judged. You feel condemned. You feel like people are watching you. You feel like you walk on eggshells because the focus is outward. And Jesus makes no mis I mean, again, Jesus is so black and white about this. Look at what he says. Why are you worried about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! <laughs> and then I underlined and bolded this word. First, get rid of the log in your own eye and you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. In other words, where should our first attention be? inward. And w here's the reality. When I look inward and look at where I'm not like Jesus, I can spend the rest of my life focused on those areas and not focused on you. Isn't that true? I can spend the rest of my life focused on all of these areas where I'm not like Jesus. And I still have work to do. And I don't need to make your life my focus. Because there's plenty of work to do inside. So we care about the things he cares about. He cares about the condition of my heart. Second, he cares about people in need. He really cares about people in need. Remember I told you when he is really passionate about something, he repeats it over and over again in the Bible. 2,000 verses in the Bible about poverty issues and people in need. 2,000. So what do you think he wants us to care about? 2,000. Matter of fact, look at the descriptions of God. I found this this last week. Isn't this great? Here's how God describes himself he, in different places in the Bible. I am the defender of the fatherless and the widow, the protector of the poor, the rescuer of the poor, the provider of the poor, the savior of the poor, the refuge of the poor. Do you hear a pattern? What is, God identifies himself this way. You want to know who I am? This is who I am. So if this is who God is, how do you think we should be? Well, these are the things they should be saying about us, right? Because this is what God self-identifies as and can back up. He doesn't just say it, he does it. When Jesus was here on earth, he cared so much for people in need. He modeled it and said, oh, by the way, what you're seeing in my life is, well, my, I'm, just, I'm just doing what my father does all, all the time. You've seen me, you've seen the father. And he ran, about caring, ran around caring about people in need, ministering and serving to people in need, and we need to be like that. It's one of the things I love, love, love about, matter of fact, right before Right before Corona, a good friend of mine in the church, we sat down together and we worked on a calendar for the whole year. <clears throat> Every month we wanted to have a different focus and we've been doing this for a while, but we were really strategic about it. And she had come up with some great creative things that we were going to be participating in over the whole year. Things that I'd never even heard of that were needs in our nation or in our community that were so, it's like, oh, we can, this will be wonderful to talk about and we will champion it for a month as a, as a church and we'll move on to the next thing and we'll show care to these people. And then, of course, Crone hit and the calendar's changed. <laughs> Because now there's so many needs right here in our own community. And so we're going to get together again, reprioritize that calendar so that we can start again being the church because this is who we are. We, he is this. So he cares about this. So for us, we have to care about it too. And so we're going to meet together again. We'll put that calendar in front of you and we will continue to serve in every way that he shows us as a church. And by the way, if you have ideas, we really want to hear those ideas. And so you can just write me, and it's just my name at gmail.com with your ideas. If you come across something, you're like, hey, can we think about doing this? Let us know, because we really want to do more of this. So God cares about the condition of my heart. He cares about people in need. And you know what he cares about the most? Number one thing he cares about, people who are far from him. It's the number one thing he cares about. <clears throat> it's why he came. Jesus came to bridge the gap between fallen humanity and perfect Father. It's why he came. Because people who are far from him matter that much to him that he would die on a cross for them, even if they choose to spend their whole lives ignoring him. And isn't this the reality of where we live right now? We live in a time where how many thousands and thousands of people in the counties around us woke up this morning and God never even popped in their mind yet? I haven't thought about him. I don't care. He's a meaningless part of their vocabulary, and the only time they say his name is when they're swearing. They don't think about him. They have no knowledge of how much he loves them and what he's done for them and what he w is inviting them into, right? Isn't that reality? We live in a world where so many people do not know about the un 
indescribable love of God. And they are apart from him today. And there's never a moment he's not thinking about them. And if half of the energy that we put into fighting about Santa could be put into fighting for people who are far from God, you couldn't build buildings big enough, could you? And so we care about people who are far from God. Years ago, one of my favorite stories in this is a story of a pastor out in California. He started pastoring back during um, the hippie time. <clears throat> so it was the hippie phase of American history. And he was really, really focused on reaching people who were far from God. And so the hippies in California started coming into his church. It was a big church. It was a traditional church. And they started filling the pews. And they really were hungry for God. The problem was a lot of their genes had beads all over them. So they had metal beads on their hippie jeans. And when you put metal jeans on a wooden pew, and you sit down and stand up, you know what it does. It scratches the pews. So one day a coalition in the church came to the pastor and said, we've got to do something about this. They're scratching up our pews. We got to either tell them to stop wearing those things or not come. And the pastor said, we have another option. Burn the pews. Get rid of the pews. And it was like a startling thing for them to hear that. It's like, yeah. Because when you're focused on non-essentials, things that don't matter at all, you sacrifice the, the wrong thing for ridiculous things. The most important thing about that story was that unchurched people were coming to the church to hear about a God of love. Who cares if we have to sand and repaint them every week? Who cares? The most important thing was happening. The thing that God was most passionate about. The thing he loved so much was taking place and they couldn't even see it. Because they're focused on something that didn't matter at all. It didn't matter in the least compared to people far from God hearing about and experiencing the tremendous love of God. That's what we need to be focused on. And we have a challenge. I mean, Really, we have a challenge here at Peniel. We want to care about what God cares about. We don't care about people who are far from God. But there's not a large population base around us. So how do we get, how do we build relationships with unchurched people in a way that we can invite them to come here or to hear about the love of God? We've got to figure that out. Because we have to care about what God cares about and he desperately cares about this. So we've got a challenge on our hands. That's okay. He'll show us. Once we start caring about it, he guides us. It's his responsibility to guide us. He'll show us what to do. So when you look at this list, where is it that you need to start? <clears throat> Some of you know that Christian unity hasn't really been a thought in your mind and you haven't really thought about how important this is to God, and so maybe that's where you're changing your value. It's like, nope, unity really matters. And you're going to walk out of here with a different perspective, or maybe it's about committing to each other in love. That you're going to acknowledge the differences and love them anyway. It's like, yep, I know that's their passion, that's their hot button, but I still love them. For others of you, the, the key thing was learning that there are things that are essential and things that are not. For some of you, you, like me, have an apology to make to God. Because you have been looking down on people who don't share your political view. Or don't share some of your beliefs that aren't essential. And you've been looking down on them. Or maybe you haven't been treating them respectfully like, they, like God commands us to. For others of you, it's time to shift your focus off of the condition of everyone else's heart onto the condition of your own heart. And make that the prioritization or the priority of your life so that you can be the person that God wants you to be. Now, maybe you're just watching here or joining us today and you're just exploring Christianity. Christianity is an amazing thing when you strip out all this other stuff that gets in the way. All this other stuff. It is the most incredible, unbelievable message. There's no re there is no way that I am so lovable that God leaves heaven and leaves perfection 
and comes and not even born into our society where you have all these medical advances. You have dentists and you got doctors and you got all that. No, running water and electricity. You don't, no, he goes and is born and leaves perfection to be born 2,000 years ago where none of those things existed so that he can lay down his life on a cross to pay for all the countless unloving things I have ever said and done. There's no way I'm that lovable to God and yet I'm that lovable to God. I'm that important to God and so are you. He cherishes you. There is literally nothing he would not do to have you in his family. Nothing. You matter that much to him. That's the good news. Let me have you bow your heads. And if you will let him, if you will receive this good news into your life, you will experience what we talk about, a personal God, a personal God of love. And can you even think about how many unloving things you've said in your life or done in your life? But our God is a God of pure love. So we can't be with him until that stuff is removed from us, paid for. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. He paid for my unloving words and thoughts and behavior, just like he paid for yours, because you matter that much. Our debt was paid. And if you will ask Jesus for this gift, he'll pay your debt. And he'll forgive you. And he'll put you in his family. And he will begin to do his work inside of you. He'll begin to show you his love. If you want this gift, just say something like this to him. Say, Jesus, I'm turning to you today. I, I know I need you. I've been unloving in my life. And I heard you died for me on that cross. Please forgive me. Please come and make your home inside of me today. Give me your gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name. Amen.